Today we're going to work toward the first model of the atom that was ever developed that accounted for how atoms interact with light. And this gave us important clues as to how the electrons inside an atom might be behaving. The first atom that was investigated was hydrogen because, of course, it's the simplest atom. It has only one electron. And as I said in an earlier video, the idea was starting to come out that maybe light would provide us with some clues as to what was going on with the electrons. But we're going to start out by looking at light and color. When we see white light, what we're really seeing is all the colors mixed together. Our eyes don't have the ability to distinguish colors from each other, and so they sort of add up. And our brain sees the sum of the colors that are available. If we see colored light, there are three explanations for that. The first one is that a prism or a diffraction grating, some device, separates the colors artificially for us and allows us to see individual colors. Another possible explanation might be that the source of the light is only producing one color. So rather than adding up colors of light, we're just seeing the only color that's available, or maybe it's a limited set of colors. And a third reason could be that the light is interacting with matter in such a way that one color is absorbed. When that happens, the spectrum becomes unbalanced, and we see what's called the complementary color. A look at this artist color will give us an example of what I'm talking about. If we see something that looks magenta, it's because, if we go 180 degrees across, green is the color that's being removed by the dye in whatever we're looking at. 180 degrees across the color wheel is the complementary color. So a blue shirt looks blue because yellow was removed. Take the yellow out of the spectrum and we see this unbalanced spectrum that makes things look blue. Cherry Kool-Aid, for example, has food coloring in it that takes out green light, or sort of a blue-green or ceylon light, and so 180 degrees across we find that red light's being removed, and that's the color that we see. This little tool can maybe help us understand. This person's got three different lamps uh, pointing toward them. If I turn on the red lamp only, if you look at the little color bubble above his head, you can see what his brain is interpreting. It sees red light, and it sees only red. Now I'll add some green. If I mix these two together, in that person's brain, they don't see red and green separately. They see the sum of red and green, which is yellow. Now I'm going to take the third primary color and mix that in there. With all three colors of light being cast into this person's eye, the brain signals that he sees are interpreted as white light. If I take out the green, now the person sees violet. I put the green back in and take out the red, now this person is going to see a cyan color, which is sort of the opposite of red. Well, this is another picture that might help us understand this. I've got a flashlight here that's right now emitting yellow light. Yellow light is hitting his eyes, he sees yellow light. If I change the bulb color, whatever's hitting his eyes, that's what he sees. Here's green, here's blue. Now, I've got a filter that I can put in place here. I'm going to switch on that filter. I've got a red filter in place, and right now with blue light coming through, he doesn't see anything, because if it looks red, that means it's screening out colors that aren't red. If I change the bulb color and move it into the red region, now he begins to see something, but only at a certain wavelength. So the dyes are very specific about what colors they take out, and that influences what color is seen. If I put all the light in there, make this a white light bulb, all the colors are hitting the filter, but only ones that make it through are the ones that are not taken out by that filter. So white light seems to contain an infinite number of wavelengths. When we pass white light through a prism, we see this continuous spectrum that seems to go from from the purple over to the red, and never really has any discontinuity. It's just a smooth, seamless transition from color to color. However, when you give gas atoms electrical energy, what happens to the atoms is they enter an excited state. They absorb the energy and become excited, and then they return to the normal state, and they give off light. So, for example, if you put neon in a glass tube, like this sign here, and you discharge electricity through it, it always seems to look pink. Another example is sodium vapor lights that are all over uh, the city, for example. If you look around town, in almost all communities now, sodium vapor lights are the, are the lights that are used to illuminate at night. 
and they look yellow. Well, when we pass that light through a prism, we see why we only see those certain colors. If you look at neon spectrum, what dominates neon spectrum is pinkish colors. And so that's what you see primarily. And it's even more apparent when we look at sodium. Sodium only has two lines in its spectrum. So all the colors are missing except for just those two. So we're only seeing yellow light when we add up in our brain. This always happens. Light from pure elements shows a spectrum of limited colors, which is called an atomic line spectrum. Each color corresponds to a wavelength. So if you have hydrogen or neon or any other thing inside of this container and you pass electricity through it, just make a discharge, like a little lightning bolt in there, pass that light through a slit, pass the light through a prism after that, you don't get a rainbow. You just get a line spectrum. This is like a fingerprint for different substances, and so we can detect what elements are present even in faraway stars by analyzing the light. Helium spectrum always looks like this. The bright lines are the lines from the spectrum, and the continuous rainbow is shown just for background, just for reference. This is nitrogen. Here's mercury. And so mercury vapor lights, which is another type of street light, looks a lot whiter. And this is the interesting one, hydrogen spectrum. It has only five visible lines. And even one of those lines is invisible to some people because it's very close to ultraviolet. So the question is, do these five lines correspond to five different positions of the electron? That's what people were asking. Well, it turns out that a better answer relates not to a different state of the atom for every color, but to a difference between states, to two different states for every atom. This bar graph represents how much energy the atom has in state number two, which is a high energy state. Like maybe these are, this would be a neon atom that's been discharged, been sparked with energy. State one represents the lower amount of energy, the minimum amount of energy that that atom can have. The difference between those two is given off as light and that's why we would see those colors. If it's absorbing light, it's going to jump up exactly into that state. So the difference between this two, the two states represents how much energy is in the light. And the more energy is in the light, of course, by the photon equation that we learned in the last video, the lower is its wavelength, and so the bluer will be the light. So a small difference in energy represents a red photon of light, or a redder photon of light, whereas a big jump represents bluer light. And other colors in between, well, they just represent different jumps between states. Let's look at this little simulation. Here's a discharge tube, so there you can see these big electrical coils, and we can spark electrical energy through here and see what's going to happen to it. Here's a single atom sitting in the middle. The one means that's what energy state that it's in. I'm going to fire an electron at it, a single electron. You can see that it jumped up to state 4 briefly, and then it jumped back down. I'm going to fire a bunch of electrons at this thing. You can see it's jumping to different energy states, and then jumping back down. And as it does, these photons of electromagnetic energy, which are the fuzzy little star-looking things in this simulation, come flying out of there. Well, the spectrophotometer down here, this spectrum builder, is showing what happens if you de detect all the different colors that are coming out of there and create a bar graph. Every time a photon hits, it makes a little squiggle on the bar graph. I'm going to beef up the electron production here and build my graph more rapidly. And as we wait for the spectrometer to build up its graph, let's look at what's happening in this little energy level diagram. This is like the drawing that I just showed you before, only it's showing the atom actually sitting in the position on this bar graph where it is at any given time, and it's jumping up and down, up and down, up and down, and it's those jumps that are producing the colors of light. Now let's change the picture so that we have a lot of hydrogen atoms in the discharge tube, and let's throw a lot of electrons at them, and then let's show our little spectrometer. Now you can see the bar graph is being built much more rapidly than it was before. This is what it would be like to be looking at a tube that has hydrogen in it that has electricity also being discharged through it. Lots of photons are being released, and so the ability to collect information about what colors are there will happen really quickly. And if we looked at the light coming from an actual discharge lamp, 
through a prism, we would see this thing built instantly in our brains. Just for fun, let's switch to a different element. Let's put neon in there. As the spectrum is built, you can see that clearly this is a different spectrum than what we get from hydrogen. Again, it's discontinuous. It's bony and not all the colors of the rainbow show there. But it's different colored light because you have different lines and they're dominated by the reds and yellows. So since only certain colors show up in the line spectrum, that must mean there's a limited number of possible jumps that are available. Those limited number of jumps can be described mathematically, and a guy named Rydberg came up with this equation. Rydberg's equation says that one over wavelength for every possible wavelength that you could see from the hydrogen spectrum fits into this pattern. You have to multiply by a constant. It's named after him the Rydberg constant. And then that is multiplied by this term, 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Now, what is n1 and n2, and what is the Rydberg constant? Well, the Rydberg constant has this value, 109,678 per centimeters. So inverse centimeters is the unit. So this is 1 over wavelength, so 1 over centimeters is going to tell you that the wavelength is measured here in centimeters. Now, there's a restriction on N1 and N2. N1 is less than N2. That's one of the restrictions in this equation. And the other restriction is this. Any N can only be 1 or 2 or 3 or any other positive whole number all the way up to infinity. So Rydberg says as long as N1 is less than N2 and as long as the Ns are only positive whole numbers, you can stick any combination of numbers in here, multiply it by my constant, and the reciprocal of that will be one of the wavelengths that you'll see in the hydrogen spectrum. He didn't know why. He just used mathematics to find a, a pattern. He was just generalizing. Let's cal calculate the wavelengths in nanometers for the n values that are given here. n equals 3 and n equals 2, 4 and 2, 5 and 2, 6 and 2. Stop the video and do the calculation for the first one and then I'll give you an answer. Then stop the video and try the calculations for the second, third, and fourth one. I'll give you answers but without solutions after that. Okay, well here's the Rydberg equation. So let's, for the first transition values, let's plug in our information. 1 over lambda is the Rydberg constant, 109,678 per centimeter times 1 over now, 1 has to be the low number, so in our first pair, that's 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over the high number squared. So in our first pair, that was 3, so 1 over 3 squared. So 1 over wavelength is equal to 109,678 per centimeter times 1 over 4 minus 1 over 9. So the, chance, the answer that you get when you do this math is... 15,233.1 per centimeters. So wavelength will be the reciprocal of that, because that's the reciprocal of wavelength. The reciprocal of 1 over 15,233.1 is 6.56 times 10 to the minus fifth centimeters. Now, just for reference, I'm going to convert this to nanometers. There are 100 centimeters in a meter, and there are 10 to the ninth nanometers in a meter. So after conversion, we come up with 656 nanometers. That certainly is visible light, because remember, we can see from the longest wavelength, 400 nanometers to our shortest visible light, which is 700 nanometers. So this would be somewhere in the middle. Well, now I'll try and do 2, 3, and 4, and I'll fill in the rest of the answers for you. We saw that for a jump from 3 down to 2, we would get a wavelength of light that was 656 nanometers. That would be the red line that we see in the spectrum. From 4 dropping down to 2, we got 486 nanometers. That's probably that teal line. 
5 down to 2 is 434 nanometers. Now remember, we can only see down to 400, so this is a pretty purple light. And then from 6 down to 2, you're going to get 410 nanometers. That's really close to the edge of our vision, and some people, in fact, can't even see that light because it's so close to the ultraviolet. So this means atoms lose or gain energy only in certain set amounts. Or another way of saying this is the energy of atoms is quantized. When we look at hydrogen spectrum, we see that the transitions actually fall into three categories. Transitions down to n equals 1 is called the Lyman series, and the Lyman series is ultraviolet, so we can't see it. Transitions down to n equals 2 from higher is the Balmer series. That's the visible stuff that we can see. Transitions down from anything higher to 3 is the Passion series, and that's infrared. We wouldn't see Passion or Lyman, but the Balmer series is that series of colors that we can actually see. The first person to come up with a model of the atom that was based on this quantization idea that would try to explain why the line spectra existed was Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr was a Danish physicist and widely recognized as one of the cleverest uh, people who has ever uh, worked with physics. Here's his idea. The electron moves in orbit around the nucleus, and the force that holds it to the nucleus is an electrostatic attraction between the two particles. So the electron is negatively charged, protons positively charged, and so this atom is held together by electrostatic pull. Just like the Earth is held to the sun by gravity and orbits around it, it's a very similar situation in Bohr's mind. So the electron is orbiting the nucleus like a planet orbits the sun. But Bohr, well, Bohr knew like every classical physicist knew, that the centripetal force for an object that's rotating around another object is mass times velocity squared divided by the radius. But he also knew that this centripetal force is created by an electrostatic attraction. And the equation that governs that is that force is equal to a constant number, we don't have to know what that number is, times the charge on the first object times the charge on the second object divided by the distance between the two objects squared. Well, in our case, the first object is an electron, so E is the charge on an electron. But the second object is a proton, which has the same charge, just a different sign. And then the distance between the two objects, well, that's just the radius of the orbit. So Ke squared divided by R squared is the force, but mv squared over r is also the force. So putting these two together, you get mv squared over r is equal to ke squared over r squared. We can simplify this a bit by canceling an r from both sides, and this leaves us with mv squared is equal to ke squared divided by r. We'll use this later on. saw that only certain orbits appear to be possible. And those are orbits that have a certain angular momentum. That angular momentum, L stands for angular momentum, falls into this pattern. L has to be n times Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. And n would have to be 1, 2, 3, any positive whole number up to infinity. Does it look familiar? That has the same n values allowed as the Rydberg equation had. Bohr started working with that, trying to figure out if he could come up with an explanation. Let's continue to follow Bohr's thinking here. He knows for some reason that he can't really explain that the angular momentum L has to be equal to n times h over 2 pi, where n is that same n that we saw with the Rydberg equation. It's only positive whole numbers. Now, because Bohr was a pretty good classical physicist, he knew some other stuff that you might know if you've had physics, like angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia, I, times omega. Now, if you haven't had classical physics, don't worry about it. I is a number that you might learn about someday, but it's not really important that you understand exactly what moment of inertia here is. Just follow the algebra, and you'll learn something about how Bohr thought his way through to a model of the atom. Now, I for a point, like an electron, orbiting around a center, like the nucleus, would be equal to 
m times r squared, where m is the mass of the object and r is the radius. So l is i times omega, but i is m times r squared, so l is m times r squared times omega. So what's omega? Omega is the angular speed. In other words, how fast is it going around in an angular fashion? But if you're measuring your angle in radians, it turns out that omega, the angular speed, is just equal to the linear speed, the velocity, v, divided by the radius of the orbit. So we can substitute up here, and that gives us that angular momentum is equal to m times r squared times v divided by r. But when you cancel an r out, you just end up with mvr, or mrv. So that means if I take this value of n and equate it to mvr, that I'll get this. n times h over 2 times pi is mvr. Now, if I wanted to know how fast the particle is moving, I can just solve this new equation that I've got for velocity. So velocity is n times h over 2 pi times m times r. Now, Bohr's first postulate had determined this. m times v squared is equal to k times e squared over r. Now, let's just review what these terms mean. m is the mass of the electron. v is the speed of the electron, the same v that we have here up in this equation. k is a constant that we don't really care what it is at this point. e is the charge on one electron, which is constant. And then r is the radius of the orbit. Now, let's substitute this v, which is nh over 2 pi mr, for that v. So now we've got this, m times nh over 2 pi m times r squared is equal to ke squared over r. I've just substituted what's on the right-hand side of this v equation for v in this other term. Now I'll complete the square. This is m times n squared h squared over 4 pi squared m squared r squared. And that's equal to k e squared over r. Well, next I'm going to simplify this a bit. I can cancel an m top and bottom. So that's just m on the bottom. I have r on the, in the denominator on both sides here, so I'll cancel an r away. And that leaves me with this. n squared h squared over 4 times pi squared times m times r is equal to k e squared. Let's say I want to find out what the radius is, which is what Bohr was interested in. I'll solve this equation for r by multiplying both sides by r, which will cancel r off on the left-hand side, and then dividing both sides by ke squared. So here's what I get. I'll write it all down up here. I'll do it in purple. r, the radius of a Bohr orbit, is equal to n squared h squared over 4 pi squared times m times k e squared. Remember, n has to be 1, 2, 3, or any positive whole number. So this is an equation that would tell Bohr what's the size of the radius of the orbit. What does he need? He needs this n number. He needs h, Planck's constant, that's a constant, divided by 4, that's a constant, times pi, that's a constant, times the mass of the electron, that's a constant, times k, which is a constant, times e squared, and e is also a constant. 
So this radius depends only really on a bunch of constants, a combined constant, and the value of n. Another postulate to Bohr's atomic theory. He said the total energy of an electron moving in an allowed orbit, in one of these n orbits, is constant. So the question becomes, what would that amount of energy be? Well, let's start from this point. We know that the total energy of this particle is going to be equal to its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. Now let's start to build from there. So starting out with this equation, energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy, basically the first law of thermodynamics. Let's use that to figure out how much energy would it have at any given orbit. Now the potential energy is just the energy stored in the position of the electron with respect to the nucleus, which is oppositely charged. The potential energy is just equal to the work that's required to get the electron in its current position. So it's attracted to the nucleus. Here's our nucleus. And here's the electron. The electron got moved from the nucleus out to where it is now through some distance. But that distance is the radius of the orbit that we're considering. Work is force times distance. Technically, it's negative force times distance because it's being moved against the pole between the two particles. So the distance change, well, that's r. What's the force? Well, the force is the electrostatic force, and we know that that, from previous consideration here, is Ke squared divided by r squared. So the potential energy of this particle, which is equal to the work, is just going to be negative k e squared over r squared times r. And we can cancel an r out, and this leaves us with minus k e squared over r. So that's the PE part of this summation. Now let's look at kinetic energy. Well, if you've had physics, you know this. Kinetic energy is equal to 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. If you haven't had physics, well, trust us, that's what it is. Now, what do we know about velocity? We had an earlier equation that said this. Mass times velocity squared is equal to Ke squared divided by r. So, 1 half mv squared is just 1 half of Ke squared over r, or Ke squared over 2r. So that's the Ke part of the... So what's the total energy? Well, it's the kinetic energy, which is Ke squared over 2r, plus the potential energy. But the potential energy was negative Ke squared over r. We could rewrite this, and we could say Ke squared over r times 1 half minus 1, if we just factor Ke squared over r from this equation. Well, 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half, so the total amount of energy that this thing is going to have is going to be Ke squared divided by r times negative 1 half. The total amount of energy that the electron is going to have in the Bohr orbit. So how much energy is that? Well, it depends on r, but we know what r is. We just solve for that. R is n squared h squared over 4 pi squared m k e squared. So let's substitute. E is equal to minus k e squared divided by 2 times n squared h squared over 4 pi squared m k e squared. That's what r is, the stuff that I just put in parentheses. So we've just substituted. Let's clear our screen and simplify this. One thing that we can do to simplify is to take this term that I've circled in blue and multiply by its reciprocal. Because dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So we'll do that. So I'll write minus Ke squared over 2 
And then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of that other term. And I'll put this all in blue just to kind of keep it clearer. So the reciprocal would have 4 pi squared m k e squared on the top. And now what was the numerator in the previous version is now the denominator, n squared h squared. Does anything cancel? It doesn't look like it. However, we can do this. We can say minus k squared e to the fourth, if we combine all the k's and e's, times 4 times pi squared divided by 2 times n squared times h squared. And I lied. We can actually cancel something. This 2 and this 4, you can divide 4 by 2. So that gives us a 2. So total amount of energy of an electron in any orbit, n, is equal to negative 2 pi squared m k squared e squared over flux constant squared times, and I'll separate the only term that is not a constant here, 1 over n squared. It's an n, not an h. And remember, n has this restriction that it can only be positive whole numbers up to infinity. So this whole thing here that I'm circling in black, that's a constant. 2 is a constant. Pi is a constant. Mass of an electron is a constant. That k is a constant. E is the charge of an electron. That's constant. And Planck's constant is constant. So those could all be combined, put together, into one number. And Bohr calls that the combined constant. Other people later on came to call it the Bohr constant. So E is equal to minus B times 1 over N squared, keeping in mind that N is only positive whole numbers. So let's evaluate B. What is B? Well, B is 2 times pi squared times... Here's the mass of an electron, 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. Here's the value of K. K is 8.988 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. If you don't know what a Coulomb is, don't worry about it. It's going to cancel out. Times E to the fourth. I actually made a mistake up here. That E squared is supposed to be E to the fourth. So here's what E is. E is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And that's going to be to the fourth power. K is supposed to be squared. That's all divided by Planck's constant, which was 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds, and that's squared. What unit do we end up with? Well, a joule is a newton times a meter. So joule squared is going to be newton squared times meter squared. This term here is going to be Newton squared meters to the fourth over coulombs to the fourth. But coulombs to the fourth is going to cancel out with the coulombs to the fourth next to it. So coulombs are not going to be part of this anymore. In the denominator down here, I have Newton squared. So I'll cancel Newton squared out. And I have meters squared. So I'll cancel meters squared and just change meters fourth to meters squared. So what terms are gone and what terms are left? I have kilograms still. I have square meters still. Coulombs are not there anymore in the numerator. Second squared are in the denominator. So the unit that I end up with is k 
kilograms times meters squared divided by seconds squared. And if you know your units from physics, you know that a kilogram meter squared per second squared is a joule. That's an energy unit. So that's the unit. What's the value? Well, if you calculate all this stuff out, you will find out that the value of the Bohr constant is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. Well, now that all that work has been done, we just know this one simple number that we can multiply times 1 over n squared, and we can know the total energy of any electron in any orbit in the Bohr atom, where n is the orbit number, which has to be a positive whole number. So to summarize, here's what we've learned so far. The energy of the electron in any orbit is given by this equation, negative b times 1 over n squared, where n is any positive whole number, and b is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. Now Bohr also said when an electron transitions from a high orbit to a low orbit, a photon is emitted from the atom that has an energy equal to the difference. In a high orbit, it's going to have more energy. In a low orbit, it's going to have less energy. The difference between the two, that's the energy of the photon that comes out. So watch this little animation. It's in a low orbit. It gains energy and becomes excited, jumps to a higher orbit. When it comes back down, it's going to give off energy in the form of light. So if you could build a little model here using Bohr's idea of orbits with four of the possible orbits that are available. Here's n equals 1. The energy here is going to be equal to minus b times 1 over 1 squared. Or we could say minus b. In orbit number 2, the energy is going to be equal to minus b times 1 over 2 squared or it's going to be minus b over 4. Now, it might look like the energy is getting lower as you go up, but remember there's a negative sign out here. So really what's happening is the energy is getting closer to zero from the negative side. So this is actually more energy than this. In the third orbit, n is 3. So e is equal to minus b times 1 over 3 squared or minus b over 9. In the fourth orbit, you can see what's happening here. e is going to be equal to minus b over 16, which is 4 squared. So as you jump from orbit to orbit, you gain more and more and more energy. When you drop down, when you transition down from here down to here, the difference in energy between these two levels well, that's going to be equal to the energy of the photon that's released during that transition. But the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times speed of light divided by wavelength. Well, what wavelengths would be emit emitted during a transition like this? So let's just take two generic orbits and calculate the energy. Here's orbit number n high. The energy when the electron's in that orbit is minus b times 1 over n high squared. And then the second orbit will be the low one, which we'll just call n low. So the energy at the low orbit is equal to minus b times 1 over n low squared. So if we want to find out the energy of the photon that's emitted, it's the difference between these two orbits. So delta e is just the difference. Energy at the high level minus b times 1 over n high squared minus the energy at the low orbit, which is going to be minus b times 1 over n low squared. I'll rewrite this, and I'll factor out b. So this is b times negative and minus a negative is positive, so I'll write this as a positive, 1 over n low squared plus 1 over n high squared. But the energy of a photon, we learned a long time ago, is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. 
So we'll substitute that for energy of the photon, and this is what we'll get. Planck's constant times speed of light divided by wavelength is equal to B times 1 over N low squared plus 1 over N high squared. This is starting to look a little bit familiar to me. In fact, if I divide both sides by HC, this is what I get. 1 over lambda is equal to B over HC times 1 over N low squared plus 1 over N high squared. So this is the equation that describes the wavelength of light that would be emitted during two energy changes in the Bohr atom. But this looks very much like the Rydberg equation. It's a complete analog. Rydberg said 1 over lambda is equal to the Rydberg constant times 1 over a low number squared minus 1 over a high quantum number squared. They're completely the same if one thing is true. If B over HC is equal to the Rydberg constant. Well, let's test it out and find out. B is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. And the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. What happens? Unit-wise, joules drop out, seconds drop out, and I'm going to come up with an answer that has 1 over meters as its unit. Here's what we get. 109.74214. And that's per meters. That's the unit. Well, let's convert to per centimeters so we can compare with the Rydberg constant. So 109.74214 over meters. And I know that a meter is 100 centimeters. So what I'm really doing is moving over the decimal point two places. So I end up with 109.742. 109,742 per centimeters. The value of the Rydberg constant that we had earlier was 109,678 per centimeter. Now that's pretty amazing how close those two numbers are. Too amazing to just be a coincidence. So Bohr very naturally thought he had come up with the solution for exactly what an atom is like. So this was a great triumph for a short time. But then it turned out that there were some problems with Bohr's atom, but we'll leave those for later. And for right now, we'll just celebrate with Bohr that he had finally figured out what's going on with electrons inside of atoms. Next time, we'll figure out what the atoms are really more likely to be like.